Continuing our idea of talking about torque and rotational inertia, uh, we're going to get into some applications of Newton's second law for rotation. So we can look at basically more realistic situations um, of objects moving and the, and the effect that having rotating objects has there. So let's look at Newton's second law for rotation. It's going to be a lot like Newton's second law for linear stuff. We're just adding an additional piece to it. So, oh, sorry, that went a little quick. So, um, with Newton's second law before, basically what we have is that acceleration is equal to net force divided by total mass. And we're going to name it a different way. So, A is acceleration of the whole system. It may not just be one object. It could be two or three objects tied together. Net force is the total external force acting on the system. And then mass is the total effective mass. And that effective mass is a really important thing. And we're going to spend... It'll become more clear as time goes on. So what I'd like to do is just kind of look at um, a linear example of that. Just kind of get us back into the swing of things. So in our linear example, let's just have a mass on a table connected to a massless pulley, connected to another mass. So we got mass 1 on the table, mass 2 is hanging down. Now we're going to do this the long way, because we're done with the easy way. So you just have to forget about that for now. So the first thing we need to do is understand that there is no friction. Now, let's draw mass 1 and the, the force is acting on it. So we know we have the normal force up, we have the weight of mass 1 down, and we have tension pulling that over. Now, this object is going to accelerate to the right, and the only force making that happen is tension. So the net force acting on our object is equal to m1 times acceleration, and it's equal to tension. So, for all kinds of force and even rotation problems, I need you to draw free body diagrams, and I need you to write Newton's second law for each free body diagram. So for our second object, we have mass 2, we have that same tension pulling up, and we have the weight, m2g, pulling down, and it's accelerating down. So here we have the net force is equal to mass 2 times the same acceleration as mass 1, and that's equal to the weight, mass 2, times the acceleration due to gravity, minus the tension. So what we're going to do is put these two equations together and get rid of our unknown tension, because we don't know tension. We want to solve for acceleration, but there's another, another unknown there that we have to get rid of. So by adding these two equations together, tension goes away. So let's just write out the first one. Mass 1 times acceleration is just equal to tension. And what's that saying is tension's the only thing accelerating mass 1. Mass 2 times the acceleration is the weight minus tension. So what we're doing there is, is saying the acceleration has to do with the weight and tension, the difference between those two. So we're going to add these two equations together, and when we do that, we see that tension crosses out, because we have tension minus tension, so that goes completely away. And we have mass 1 times acceleration plus mass 2 times acceleration equals mass 2 times the acceleration due to gravity. We can factor the acceleration out, so we have mass 1 plus mass 2 times the acceleration is equal to mass 2 times gravity. And then if we solve for the acceleration, we have m2g over mass 1 plus mass 2. And so the nice thing there is that we have on top the net external force, the weight pulling on the whole system, that's the only one that's not an internal force. And on the bottom, we have the total mass, net effective mass. That's how I want you to think of these things, net force, net effective mass. Because that's going to play a role with rotation, rotating objects. So if we look at this rotational example, I'll talk a little bit about what we mean. So it's not going to be the same thing, but imagine we have a disk and we wrap a string around that disc, this disc has mass m, and we wind it with string, 
It's kind of like a yo-yo, really. We attach that string to the ceiling, and we're just going to let go of the disc and look at the acceleration when that happens. Now, it's tempting to say that when we do this, the acceleration of the disc is the acceleration due to gravity, but that's not the case. <coughs> Pardon. And we can, we can demonstrate that uh, a little bit later. So the disc is wound with a string attached to a ceiling. So, just like before, we're going to draw a free body diagram. No, we want to find the acceleration. Of course, we want to find the acceleration of the disc as it falls from the ceiling. So, before we even start, we need to know, yes, that the mass is m, but since it's a disc, the moment of inertia is one-half mr squared. That's going to be important. So, for our big picture idea for acceleration being net external force divided by total effective mass, um, the effective mass for this object is going to be, yes, the regular mass, but the moment of inertia contributes to that effective mass. So let's look at how that looks. Let's draw a free body diagram. So on our free body diagram, we have the mass, we have weight pulling straight down, mg, and we have tension pulling up. Those are our forces. So the acceleration is down. When we look at net force, those are the two forces acting on the object. So, mass times acceleration is going to be equal to the weight minus the tension. That's just like before. Okay. We don't know the tension, though, and we don't know the acceleration, which means we have two unknowns, and we have to get rid of them. So we need to look at a second equation to do that. That equation is going to be the rotational equation net torque. Now, it's important when we look at this to see which one of these things is a torque. Tension is acting along the edge and it's going straight up and weight is pulling straight down from the center of the object. So if we were to draw lines of action on this object, let's see if we can do that real quick, uh, blue line of action, from the center of our object here in this picture, one line of action goes this way another line of action could go in that direction. So looking at those lines of action, weight is not a torque, but that tension could give us a torque. That's at 90 degrees to that line of action. That's really good news. So net torque is the moment of inertia times the, the angular acceleration. And looking at it, gravity is not a torque. It acts at the center of the object. It acts along the line of action. But tension is. And so the torque from tension, the torque from tension is the force of tension times the distance that that tension is away from the pivot, which happens to be the radius here. Now, we want these two equations to add together like the other two equations that we had. We need to substitute in for the moment of inertia. Well, that's one half mr squared. And what we can do there is a relationship between alpha and a. Alpha is r times, sorry, a is r times alpha. And since it's the same object and we're rolling without slipping, we can make that substitution. So we're going to rewrite that net torque equation. So where we see i, we're going to write 1 half mr squared. And where we see alpha, we're going to put in a over r. And that's going to equal tension times the radius. Now what's really cool is we have a radius on the bottom that's going to cancel out one of those r squareds and then a radius on the top on both sides. So all of the r's go away and our equation looks like one half ma equals tension. That equation and our first equation can go together. Watch what happens. So ma equals mg minus t. Then we're going to add to that one half ma equals tension and we're going to add them together. So the tensions cross out, and we have ma plus one-half ma equals mg. Let's factor out the a, solve for it, and then kind of look at this result. So a is mg over m plus one-half m. 
mg is the net external force on the system. m is the mass of the object, and one half m is the contribution to the effective mass from that rotational inertia. What we've done is given the system a little bit more inertia by causing it to rotate. Let's just reiterate that point. mg is our net external force. And then down there on the bottom, we have our effective mass. It's the mass plus the contribution to the mass from the rotational inertia. Rotational inertia was one-half mr squared. It's basically just the r squared dropped off of our moment of inertia. That's the effective mass of a rotating object. So that effective mass includes, one, the mass, and, two, the rotational inertia, or the rotational mass, which is that one-half m part. So let's look at another example. Just kind of a how-to, really quick. So the first thing, as always, is to draw a free body diagram. The second thing is to write net force equals mass time acceleration for each and every mass that we have and to include all forces. So we want Newton's second law for linear motion for everything. Then we're going to identify which forces are torques and to find out how much that torque is. So identify and the define torques acting on the system. And then we'll use all of those torques to fill out net torque equals I alpha. And if the system doesn't split, we can actually do it. We can actually solve for it, and we can substitute that alpha is A over R, letting us translate between angular acceleration and linear acceleration, letting us put those two equations, or three equations, if the case may be, that we build together, but putting them in the same language, talking about the acceleration of the system. Then we're going to add net force and net torque equations together and solve for the acceleration. And then we can go back to each one of those individual things and find individual torques and the unknowns. So. Let's look at an example and let's go through all of this. So for our example, it's going to be kind of like what we had before. We have mass 1, but our pulley is going to have mass this time. Our pulley is going to have rotational inertia. And so what we expect is for the effective mass of the system now to be larger than it was before. Not only is our external force of gravity going to have to move the mass on the table and the hanging mass, it also is going to have to spin the pulley, which has mass. So mass 1, mass 2, and mass 3, where mass 2 is the pulley. It is a massive pulley now. Up until now, we've ignored the mass of the pulley. Now, interestingly enough, because this pulley has mass, tension 1 and tension the, the, the tension in the string can't be the same anymore. There's some mass in the way causing us to have two different tensions. So because this pulley has mass and it accelerates, there are going to be different, the tensions are going to be different. There are different tensions. So looking at mass 1, we can draw the free body diagram for it. There's tension pulling it to the right. We'll call it tension 1. Weight is pulling down and the normal force is pulling up. For the pulley, Tension 1 is pulling in that direction, and tension 2 is pulling down, and that's mass 2. Now, if tension 1 and tension 2 were the same, the net torque would be 0, and it wouldn't spin. We know it's going to spin. That's why we have to have different tensions. And then for mass 3, tension 2 pulls up, and the weight pulls down. So we're going to go through and do our... Newton's second law for mass 1 and mass 3. 
Well, that's the direction of acceleration for every object. The mass on the table is going to go to the right. The pulley is going to spin clockwise, and mass 3 is going to go down. So, the net force on mass 1 is mass 1 times the acceleration. And the only thing accelerating that is tension 1. But for mass 3, mass 2 times the acceleration, but it's the weight minus the tension. Now, looking at this, we're going to identify and define the torques. So tension 2 on the pulley is a torque, and that's going to be tension 2 times r. And that's going to be positive because it's in the direction of the angular acceleration. Tension 1 is going to be negative tension 1 times r because it's opposite the direction of the acceleration. Tension 1 wants to make it spin counterclockwise, opposite the acceleration, and tension 2 wants to make it turn clockwise, with the acceleration. That's why one of them is a positive torque and one of them is a negative torque. So, putting that all together, net torque is I alpha. It's tension 2 times R minus tension 1 times R. Now, before we can put all three of these together, we have to substitute in for the moment of inertia and substitute in for alpha. So, I is one-half mR squared, and alpha is A over R. So let's plug both of those in. So one-half mR squared times A over R is tension 1 times R minus tension... Sorry, tension 2 times R minus tension 1 times R. So if we look at it, the A over R and the R squared, one of those R's crosses out. And then we have two R's on the right-hand side. Those cross out with the other R there. There's no more R left in our system. So that equation now becomes 1 half M2A equals T2 minus T1. So now I have three equations that I can put together. So the first one, M1A equals T1. Add to that M3A equals M3G minus T2. And then our third equation, 1 half M2A is T2 minus T1. And you can kind of already see what's going to happen. We have a positive T1 at the top, a negative T1 at the bottom, positive T2 at the bottom, and a negative T2 in the middle. So all those T's go away. M1A plus M3A plus 1 half M2A equals just M2G, M3G. So we're going to factor out the A, add all of those masses together. M1 plus M3 plus 1 half M2 times the acceleration equals m3 times g. Divide by all those masses. And we see again sort of the same little pattern. The net external force on the system divided by the effective mass. Each one of the hanging masses and the moment of inertia without the r squared part of the massive pulley. Net external force divided by total effective mass.